。好，呃呃，谢谢，非常感谢大家啊、呃，利用宝贵的时间来嗯、呃、参加我们本次的网络研讨会。我会先用中文为大家做一个开场介绍。那个呃，我是中伦律师事务所合伙人樊小娟，最早呃致力于区块链相关的法律研究，呃也在一些呃知名的相关媒体上发表了一些文章，并且参与一些呃区块链的建设项目。那二零一九年曾经参与出版《Libra》一种金融创新实验，并且在年底也出版了一九年的年底出版了专著《企业炼金术：区块链法律应用指南》。那那个啊，我们本次研讨会的主题是区块链与智能合约在商业法律中的应用。随着科技的发展，我们说呃 A B C D， 就是我们说 A 是 A I 人工智能 ，B 就是 Blockchain 区块链 ，C 是我们说 Cloud 就是云 ，D 是 Data 是大数据。呃 A B C D 的发展已经催生了数字经济，我们新的数字世界已经到来。那个，嗯，那我们知道参加本次研讨会的大部分是法律专业人士，所以我们我们这些法律人士有没有考虑过法律行业在数字世界的未来？我们的合同形式，那技术人士可以认为 code is the law， 那简单便捷，但是我们法律人士可能会说 code is the law 吗？在数字世界 ，code 和 law 的关系已经变得非常微妙。那个同时，我们的争议解决形式呢，会有怎么样的改变？呃，我们说改把改变是肯定的，但是我们怎么样去迎接这个改变，甚至去创造这个改变呢？这就是我们本次研讨会的一个初衷，希望引起大家的思考和参与。那今天非常有幸，呃，可以与 j r a j 公司共同举办这个研讨会。j r a j 是一家成立于瑞士的法律科技公司。公司主要创始成员就是我们接下来会见到的，呃 ，CEO Alexandro Palombo， 还有 CTO Luca Daniel， 还有 CLO Rafael， 嗯 b a d a g i n i 三位先生。那个啊、呃，自成立以来 j e r r 是利用区块链的底层算法，致力于使每一个人在任何的地方都可以获得百分之百的线上、快捷、低成本、全透明的、更加高效。并且有法律效力的一个嗯司法正义。那我们在今天的研讨呃研讨会中，我先问大为大家简单介绍一下我们几个主讲人的一个背景情况。首先是那个嗯 j e r r 的 CEO Alexandro Palombo 先生，他在过去的三年中，在全球范围内进行过多次的演讲和发言。Alexandro 先生还被任命为呃圣马力诺共和国生态发展和整合部。呃，科学委员会的负责人最近还被任命为牛津大学深度科学争议解决实验室的呃顾问委员。那那个呃，卢卡丹纽先生是 j e r r 的 CTO， 他数十年深耕新兴科技，目前是负责 j e r r 区块链法律生态系统的所有的技术和运营。那卢卡先生目前是生活在印度的硅谷巴加罗尔。嗯，在在这里，他是组建了一个网络的服务机构，呃，为嗯很多初创企业中建立了一个稳定的这个呃、啊、生态关系。那那个呃、啊，我们说 j e r r 的 CLO 就是 r a f a e l b a t t i g i n i 先生，他是一个意大利的一位意大利的职业律师，那个呃、啊、是 b a t t i g i n i di Sabato 的 law firm 的创始人。那个呃，为中小企业和初创企业的创新、国际化、区块链的技术，还有并购公司业务以及合同方面提供一些法律服务。同时，他还是全球律师运动组织 Legal Hacker 意大利分部的组织者之一。那呃，还有一位演讲者是呃，卢伊吉·卡蒂萨尼先生，是这儿的法律工程师。他是国际贸易法律硕士，意大利的职业律师，也是 b a t t a g i n i di Sabato Law Firm 的律师。鲁伊吉先生为初创公司和中小企业，呃，提供商公司的业务和商务合同方面的法律服务，并且对呃区块链相关的创新和国际仲裁均有深入的研究。作为一个一作为一名年轻律师，正是这样的兴趣和经历，使他成为了这儿的呃一员。
。今天呢，那个呃 r a p h a e l b a t a g i n i 先生会作为第一位演讲者，为大家介绍智能合约，为大家介绍智能法律合同的一个基本原理，包括智能法律合同的定义、来源以及实际可行的方案。接着会有呃 l u g i n i 呃 l u i g i c a n t i s a n i 先生。呃，为大家讲述从传统的争议解决到线上争议解决的数字化进程，以及区块链技术能够为此带来的优势和便利。Alexandro 和 Luca 先生会在之后带来关于法律科技领域具体实用业务相关的一个演讲。那接下来我们就呃，最后会有我跟大家一起分享呃中国法律科技的一些发展状况。那接下来我们就欢迎。Rafael b a t a g i n i 先生带给我们的主题演讲 ：Smart Legal Contracts. Hello, hello, Rafael, Mr. Rafael. Hello, hello, Jay. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi, you. nice to meet Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody, for for being here today.、Uh, so, shall I start with my presentation?、Uh, okay. Apparently, I cannot share my screen. Uh, in the meantime, that this technical issue is resolved, I can I can start discussing.、Uh, so my my presentation is about the smart legal contracts, and of course, this start with、um, what a smart contract is. Actually, before discussing what a smart legal contract is,、uh, in order to do so, we need first of all to to point out that. Uh, smart contract is not something that was born with blockchain. Smart contract was theorized in 1994.、Uh, Nick Zabo, who was a, 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 a computer scientist and also a, a legal scholar,、um, theorized the, the, the smart contract.、Uh, apparently, I finally have the possibility. Yes, just give me a sec, please. Okay. Okay.、Um, so you are seeing now my my presentation.、Uh, so in 1994, Nick Zabo、uh, suggested a first definition of smart contract, which was a smart contract is a computerized transaction protocol that executes the terms of the contract. So basically, smart contract is a software. That executes the terms of a, a, a contract, and the purpose of doing so was to lowering fraud laws, arbitration, and enforcement costs. Then, in 1995, Nick Zabo suggested a new definition of smart contract, according to which smart contract is a set of promises, and It's smarter than the paper-based version of of the of the same set of promises, and he also pointed out pointed out correctly that no use of artificial intelligence was implied. So, smart contract is、uh, a software. The AI executes the terms of a contract. It includes a set of promises. And finally, in 1996. Nick Zabo、uh, suggested a, a, a third version of this definition, which was a smart contract is a set of promises specified in digital form.、Uh, interesting enough, he, this smart contract approach didn't have a very wide uh, uh,、um, resonance. We had to wait until 2014. When the Ethereum blockchain and the Ethereum white paper were divulged to the public, and and then were was the time where the the, the term smart contract was、uh, appreciated by a wider range of people, because the inventor the、uh, of Ethereum Ethereum. Were, Is the first blockchain that was created especially for smart contract, meaning、um, computer software that executes the terms of a contract, 
uh, was adopted. Uh, actually, we should talk about a decentralized smart contract, meaning a smart contract deployed on a blockchain. Uh, but since the uh, Ethereum blockchain became so uh, so utilized by by a uh, large amount of people, when we now use the word smart contract, we are implicitly saying it is a smart contract on a blockchain. And if you look at the um, legal definitions of smart contract available in uh, um, nations such as Delaware, Tennessee, or Malta, Italy, smart contract is always linked to distributed ledger technology, to blockchain. So today we can actually say that a smart contract is a smart contract only if it's deployed on a blockchain. And what you see here is the actual appearance of a smart contract. So it's a text written with a programming language, for example, Ethereum and uh, the chain that is a Chinese blockchain where Jur is, is developed, um, adopted the so-called Solidity programming language. Um, so in a nutshell, a smart contract is an event-driven software uh, that provides an output. Event-driven because a smart contract requires a triggering event in order to to start working, to start functioning. And uh, this um, triggering event might be an information that is present on the blockchain, or might be an information that is available outside the blockchain. In this case, we need someone or something that takes this information outside the blockchain and send this information to the smart contract this source of information is called Oracle. Oracle are the source of information from off-chain to smart contracts on-chain. And Oracles might be a human person, a legal entity like a bank, a website like an index or the stock exchange, or might be a hardware like a sensor. You can imagine a GPS sensor may provide an information concerning the, uh, the, the position of an object, such as a container. Um, after giving this theoretical explanation, I would like to move to a more uh, practical approach with the FISI case study. Uh, FISI was a project from AXA, uh, which is a multinational insurance company, launched in 2017 and ended at the end of 2019. Uh, it was an insurance policy on flight delays and cancellation managed by a smart contract. Uh, so basically, you had to go to, to, to the FISI.AXA website you uh, concluded a traditional online insurance uh, contract, but behind it, there was a smart contract. Uh, a smart contract that in the 2017 version was quite simple, let's say, because it was comprised by 221 lines of code. And actually you can check the code uh, by, by uh, searching it on the Ethereum blockchain, and you will be able to click on this presentation later on uh, to check on blockchain the actual code of this smart contract. The insured, insured event was only the two hour delay of flight, and uh, very specific data were stored on the uh, smart contract. The flight details, the limit time of our arrival, uh, the premium paid, the indemnity to be paid, and product ID, I mean, uh, meaning the, the typology of contract. 
the interesting part here is that the source of this information, the oracle, in this very case, was AXA itself. So many, uh, many, many people um, criticized this approach from AXA because they believed it was only, uh, you know, like a um, marketing approach uh, with no actual uh, um, trust uh, involved in, in this. Um, but in 2019, a new version of this uh, smart contract was deployed. And it was a much more complicated smart contract because if the first version, as I mentioned before, was uh, made of 221 lines, the new version was more than 750 lines. Uh, the reason of this is that, first of all, the insured event was not only the, the two-hour delay, but also the cancellation of the, of the flight. The data collected were the same, meaning the flight details, light, uh, limit time of arrival, premium paid, indemnity, and product ID. But in this case, there were two very important features added. First of all, was that there was an external oracle, a third party oracle, which is Flight Stats, that is a website that monitor the um, flights all over the world. So in this case, it was no longer AXA, the oracle providing the crucial information concerning the status of, of the flight, but was a third party provider. And secondly, uh, that payments in Ether were possible. Ether is the cryptocurrency of the Ethereum blockchain. And in, in the second version uh, of the FISI contract, FISI smart contract, it was possible for the user, for the client, for the customer to pay in Ether and to receive payments in Ether, all of which was automatically uh, managed by the smart contract. Also, in this case, you can check the actual smart contract and each transaction managed by this smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain at the link provided. Uh, of course, you should feel free to uh, go deeper uh, on this case study and you will find um, specific links to several uh, articles and also a podcast to uh, go deeper in this case study. Uh, it, it, is it is important to state again that this um, project was uh, shut down in uh, December 2019. Um, in my personal opinion, this was a very interesting use case. It is the reason why I wanted to present it to you today because it is the um, it is an example of how a multinational company, insurance company, uh, approached this very new technology. They started with the first step with a simple, let's say, simple enough smart contract with no external oracle, and then they they did a very important step forward with a much more longer, much more complicated smart contract with an external oracle and payment in cryptocurrency. Uh, I can assure you that this is not as simple as said for a huge company. Uh, so I actually appreciated how AXA decided to step in into the blockchain realm, the smart contract realm, and I actually hope they will um, start a new project, a new improved version of the FISI uh, smart contract. So thank you for, for attending to my presentation. I hope this shed some light on what a smart contract is and how a smart contract can be utilized in an actual uh, practical way for a very traditional contract like um, insurance contract. 
um, so that you can understand um, how the smart contract can actually impact the legal world and uh, how we can move from a smart contract to a smart legal contract, where a smart legal contract might be, or where the smart contract is a tool to automate obligations uh, drafted, provided for under a contract, a, a traditional contract, or smart legal contract may also mean um, total substitution of the traditional contract with a text written in computer code and traditional language. I want to, to stress this. When you will be able to check the code of the FISI contract, you will see that information are not written only in computer code, but also in traditional language. In order to explain to uh, non-developers what's the actual meaning of the computer code deployed on the blockchain. So thank you very much again, and I am available for any questions you might have. Okay. Federico, Jane, Jane, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rafael. So um, if anyone has questions, you can um, ask now. I'll, you know, if you have questions later, we will have the um, Q and A section after all the speeches. Okay, anyone has question? No. Okay. If okay, if if no, then let's invite Luigi uh, Catisani to have a speech. This builds resolution and the blockchain. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about online dispute resolution. And thanks for, uh, thanks, Raffaele, for your clear explanation that will also help me to uh, explain uh, a few concepts. So let me share my presentation. Okay, here we go. I hope that you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So let's move on. Um, the top, yeah, the topic that I'm going to discuss is precisely online dispute resolution meant as a way for, on the one hand, uh, improving access to justice, and on the other hand, also evolving it, like making possible things that were not previously possible. Okay, so I assume that most of you are familiar with the notion of alternative dispute resolution. So methods for resolving disputes different from national litigation, methods such as mediation, conciliation, arbitration. Yeah, uh, usually in the European uh, continent, arbitration is not included in the large group of ADR. In the US, uh, they use uh, ADR as a way to include arbitration, but you know, this difference about mm, terminology are not so relevant for the purpose of this explanation. The idea is that everything that is different from national litigation can be considered ADR, okay? So most of you are familiar with these tools, I assume, and probably you, in your life, you have chosen uh, mediation sometimes to avoid going before a court. And why? Because uh, litigation can be expensive, it can be super time consuming, and the parties may not be happy at the end of the day because uh, there's a winner, there's a loser, but they both spend a lot of time, efforts, energy, and there will be a disappointed party. Uh, last but not least, you still need to 
enforce your decision, you know, the judgment made by the court. And so other costs, other waste of time, other energies. And this is very, you know, demanding. Yes, also mm, converting into an effective result uh, a settlement agreement made by, med by mediation or an arbitral award made uh, by arbitration can be difficult, yes, for sure. But the idea of IDR is covering mm, different needs, okay? Like, depending on my need, depending on my transaction, I can choose the most appropriate tool. And sometimes the tool that way for resolving my disputes is not national litigation litigation before domestic courts. And if that's the underlying concept, like using different dispute resolution methods for covering different needs, it's easy to explain why and how ODR, so online dispute resolution, came to light. Basically, ODR is just a branch of ADR, okay? And it basically answered to this uh, question, to this issue. I love this quote by Franz Kaffa. You know, love should be accessible at everyone at any time. Like it, ODR is a way to um, making things way more accessible and also um, available at any time, like quicker. And this became really, really true in the light of internet, e-commerce, online transactions, you know, by the by 90s uh, and on, we had a lot of online transactions, uh, making business become quicker in a way, and also different, okay, because agreements were concluded in a different way, like the way people make small, medium, a large transaction kind of changed. And this required new tools for resolving disputes. I believe that you are familiar with the idea of IDR in practice, even if maybe um, while using it, you, were, you didn't re realize that you were actually dealing with an ODR uh, system. Because you can find ODR system embedded in platforms such as eBay, Amazon, or uh, even Airbnb as far as I can see. Like the way they uh, manage claim, answer to client customers' needs, that's, that is an ODR system in some way, okay? Now, um, as far as I can see, there is a bit of confusion sometimes about what an ODR exactly is. And so uh, I personally try to uh, get to classify them. But before getting there, I just want to remind this. Uh, we strongly believe that the problem, okay, that um, ODR uh, are trying to solve nowadays is going beyond the scope of e-commerce, okay? If e-commerce online transactions were just the basis for the rise of ODR, now the idea is going farther. It's like improving access and provide for more cost-effective more cost effective ways for resolving disputes. And why uh, online? Even for disputes that are not based on transaction uh, that are made online. So why going beyond the scope of e-commerce, online platforms, online transactions? Well, because actually, according to an OECD report, um, the 46% uh, of human beings live on the protection of the law, while more than the 50% of human beings are active internet users. That means that nowadays internet is way more accessible than cards, tribunals, or other ADR system. So if internet 
is way more accessible. It thinks that internet can be the pathway, the gate for entering a, a large justice system. And so here we go with this tentative classification. Uh, there are online features, okay? In my view, these are not, uh, let's say, complete ODR system because having online features is just taking a part of a dispute resolution method and using internet technology to streamline it. And so I don't know if in China you have functions like this, but for instance, in Italy, in Italy, you can file certain requests online. Okay, there are, and I will show you one uh, in just a few seconds, uh, arbitration chamber that allows you to file a request for arbitration online. There are, uh, in certain country, uh, specific domestic, so even domestic procedures that allow you to deposit the file case online. You see, this is just a way for implementing uh, to a limited extent online uh, features, online technology. So it's not a complete ODR system. On the other hand, we have uh, procedures based on an, an imitative or transformative approach that try to replicate uh, a procedure uh, and try to move it online, like entirely. And so we have electronic arbitration, electronic mediation, electronic ne negotiation, and so on and so forth. So basically electronic ADR, EADR, let's say. Obviously, all the experiments that you made with online features, electronic ADR can be, let's say, used to improve also litigation before domestic cards. And that's where we talk about online cards, you know? As I said, in Italy, it's possible, even for national litigation, so litigation before domestic cards, uh, have certain uh, phases of the procedure managed online, like depositing the file case for certain kind of claims or depositing certain requests, stuff like that. So you see how experimenting online in different dispute resolution methods can also help uh, domestic litigation. Like what you experiment there can be implemented in the other uh, large group of uh, dispute resolution method. So, uh, and the last part that I would like to mention is the, uh, the so-called automated ODR. So these are fully online procedure but the idea here is that uh, internet technology is used to provide automation. So this is how we link to what Rafael was explaining, okay, regarding blockchain smart contract. Well, actually blockchain and smart contract is not the only way to provide automation. Basically everything that implements algorithms meant to automate part of the procedure can be considered a sort of automation. But for sure, blockchain and smart contracts provide for uh, you know, a, a large uh, use of automation. And I will show you how in a few seconds. Let's start with uh, a few examples, okay? This is an example of online, uh, what is just an online feature. So, it's not an entire procedure online, but a phase of it, a phase of this procedure is made, is made online. This is the platform of the LCIA, which you probably know since is the most uh, famous and important arbitral institution uh, in UK, based in UK, actually based in London. And they provided this platform for filing requests for arbitration online. And so this is, uh, let's say, the, the page where you can file a new request. When you 
click on File New, you can choose between option A, uh, which says file by uploading documents. So basically you can upload your own request for arbitration. So something that you have written on your own or option two, file with standard electronic form. So you can go through an electronic form uh, designed by, uh, provided by the platform itself. You can file it and you have your request for arbitration uh, filed online. You see, this is, an, uh, this is an example of the user interface. This is where you uh, enter the claimant's details and then you move on to, the, to section B where you file um, where you enter, sorry, respondents' details and then arbitration agreement and so on and so forth. Everything that is required under the LCIA rules to have uh, a complete uh, and admissible request for arbitration. So this is interesting in my view. And even if it's not a fully online procedure, it's still something, you know, you make way more accessible and easier uh, at least the introduction phase of the arbitral proceedings. And also the electronic form can serve as a guideline because if you think of it, it exactly tells you what you need to be doing to have a complete request. So this is also helps. And now I would like to show you a fully online procedure. Uh, it's something that we developed at JOR. So for me, it's the easiest way to explain, to talk about an ODR because it's something that uh, we are really familiar with. This is uh, the Jure Beta platform, okay, which uses smart contracts to secure your contracts, your transactions, and also provide uh, a quick and basically uh, a dispute, uh, a quick dispute resolution way at almost no cost, okay? And the people that you're seeing there are, well, obviously Luca by the Jure team, we were, who was assisting to uh, members of the Jure community, um, Stefan and Daniela, which performed, okay, a purchase uh, of a car. One was the seller, the other one was the buyer on our platform, on the Jure Beta platform. And I'm pretty sure that Federico can share the whole story by means of the chat. Anyways, uh, how does this platform work? Well, basically the parties, so the buyer and the seller uh, landed on the platform. They um, obviously uh, created their wallet. They enter these deta details, so the, electron the details of the electronic wallets of both parties, name, uh, eventually the, the email. And then by means of this user interface, they set up their contractual relationship. Actually, they had a traditional contract, okay? So this is also interesting because this is how you can connect traditional uh, re contract relationship based on paper contracts to online system. They had a written uh, paper-based contract and they moved the details on the platform. So they started to fill in uh, the KPI session they indicated a, a sort of a proof of performance. They set up the duration of the contractual relationship. And then, and this is the most relevant part when we deal with automation, they deposited the consideration in escrow, okay? So yeah, this, this shows you how they filled in all the details. This is where they set up the contract value and the value was expressed in Jure tokens because this is a, a blockchain based platform where you need to convert your sum in tokens and you need tokens to interact with the platform. And after that, okay, uh, as I said, they completed, they deposited the sum in escrow and they uh, used the intra platform system for acceptance of the offer to lock the price. 
This is where automation comes into play because the Jure Beta platform provides for a way, for a tool for resolving disputes. It's a crowd-based system. In other words, it's a system where the community, so people that use the platform and have Jure tokens can participate and vote like Imagine of the ancient Greece, okay, where people participated in the forum and decided the outcome of the dispute. This is what you can do. And because you have a smart contract that serves as an escrow and it's connected to the online dispute resolution method, the decision made uh, by voters, by the decision makers, by the community members that vote, becomes the source of information for the smart contract. You remember when Raffaele talked about the source of information, the oracles? Well, that online dispute resolution method, so basically the decision made by uh, the voting members of a community, becomes your information, becomes the output, okay, that serves as an input for the smart uh, the escrow smart contract and allows for the allocation of the sum. So depending on what was the outcome of the dispute, the sum is automatically allocated to one of the party or also split, okay, depending on, you know, uh, the proposals because this system basically works like sort of baseball arbitration. Party A says, I believe that the sum should be split in this way. Party B says, I believe that the sum should be split in the other way. And so the voters decide which is the best proposal. I mean, the proposal that sounds fair according to how the case evolved, according to how the contractual relationship evolved. And then the voters decide, you know, one of this, which is the winning proposal. And depending on the winning proposal, the sum is uh, allocated to the winning party. So this is shows you how a wall procedure can be managed online. This is shows you how automation can come into place. And in this case, it comes into place because first, it regulates the interactions online between parties and decision makers. Second, it provides for an automated allocation of the disputed sum, which removes one of the most problematic thing in online dispute rec uh, in online in dispute resolution in general, which is the allocation of the sum, which is the execution of the, the decision. On this platform and on other online dispute platform, not necessarily based on blockchain. Okay, think of Cyber Settle, which was maybe the first successful ODR system entirely based on algorithms, even if it didn't use smart contracts or blockchain. I suggest you to Google it. Uh, you know, what this platform do is removing the need for going before a card and say, hey, I need my decision enforced. You don't need it because the system automatically, in, I mean, this system automatically moves your sum automatically serves the purpose of your, uh, let's say, dispute of your claim. Uh, and so, yeah, these are just uh, other few screenshots that shows you how the platform branch. You see, this is where uh, you choose success or dispute. If you're not pleased with how the contract has been performed, you start a dispute. And this is the user interface to show you how voters are currently, I mean, members of the community are currently voting the two proposals that I mentioned, proposed A, proposal A and proposal B. That's the percentage of the vote. And the system is very transparent. So you can check all but, uh, users that have vote here. They are listed according to their, to the number of their electronic wallets. Uh, you can also read the message that they leave uh, so basically the arguments that they provided to uh, sustain their arguments, to sustain, to motivate their decision, how they voted. And so this is, this also gives you uh, a good understanding of who is an engaged and serious voter and who is not. And eventually, um, 
but this is another topic maybe understanding how the relationship between decision makers vote but it's just to give you an, uh, an understanding okay of the platform and then yes when the, the duration of the dispute has expired you have the final result okay so in this case is more than 51 percent for this proposal the proposal uh, made by John Carpenter. Uh, obviously, it's a pseudonymous. Um, and then the the smart the, the the sum is allocated to the winning party according to the outcome of this voting system. So just to conclude, smart contracts and blockchain. I mean, LDR in general can be a way to automate and provide more accessibility and in some case, uh, lowering costs, okay? Blockchain and smart contracts uh, allow to do something more, like implement algorithms to automate, set up platforms where community can decide. They can be used to, obviously, since they're based on blockchain, this means also a more uh, secure environment and information, you know, are recorded on blockchain, they're immutable, all the technicalities of blockchain. But as you can see, they also provide for a way for creating new ODR, since the example that you've uh, seen so far is not the imitation of another dispute resolution mechanism. It's something completely new. Yes, it's inspired by systems such as uh, baseball arbitration and other stuff, but per se, it's something totally new. But this technology can also use to replicate existing ADR. So I believe that these are mm, really versatile tools. I hope that the explanation is, was clear. And if you have more questions, feel free to contact me and Wall, your team. And now it's time for a QA, I assume. Or if you have questions right now, or we can talk later when our every speaker has presented. Okay, Luigi, mm. do you see the questions from Raymond? Raymond, Xu. Where is the question? Uh, 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 you, yeah, I like the Jura system. Question and answer. Okay, yeah, I'm reading it. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll put an answer. Uh, I like the Jura DR system. I think the key for the success is the Jura token, which will serve as the consideration payment medium to settle dispute. Could the system also accept other cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin? Okay, USDT or other currencies issued by other platform. Okay, uh, as far as I know, since all these details are under developing, under development, and I'm sure that Luca can give you more details, but the idea is that the Jur token represents. Uh, I mean, we have different crypto cryptocurrencies because they represent different value. The Jure token actually represents uh, the value of this ecosystem. And it's not just a payment token. So uh, you see, Bitcoin is just a payment token. The token is made for make, uh, for make payment, okay? Mm, for making payments. The Jure, sys the Jure token is a bit different because it's not just payment it's also utility you basically use it as a tool as a let's say as a electronic pass for performing at other actions uh, which you cannot see in this beta version of the platform but i can give you a few examples let's say it can be used to for instance set up uh uh, an arbitration hub, okay, since the platform is evolving and is actually trying to implement also proper arbitral chambers, online arbitral chambers. It can be used basically as a pass for other interactions between the players engaged 
in the ecosystem. So it's not just made for payment. So can you use other uh, cryptocurrencies or other kind of currencies? My answer is directly, not really. But the idea is that you can convert the other currencies that you have. And if your answer is there will be uh, a sort of automated exchange so that I can perform my actions with other currencies and then the conversions in your token is automatically performed. Well, this is a technicality that I will not spoil right now. If Luca wants uh, to share more about this, <laughs> he can uh, for sure. Mm. But it is that at the end of the day, you are using the Jur token, okay? Even if you convert, regardless if the conversion is automated or not, you're still relying on your tokens. I see another question, which is in the chat system. Uh, may I ask how much and how long time one of your procedure takes? I guess that this depends on the ODR uh, system that you are using. Like for me, I've used the system of Amazon a few times and it took just a few days. And as regards the Jubera platform, does the example that I show you uh, is like based on seven days duration, seven days duration. So it really depends, but usually, usually they're meant to be quick. Okay, uh, if no more questions, let's continue. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, have Alexandro uh, Pabo, sorry, <laughs> Palombo. Uh, will speak uh, about blockchain and justice, Jer's use case. Hello everyone, I'm trying to uh, also share my video. It's really, uh, I mean, a great occasion today to, I mean, be with you. Thank you, Fan, for organizing it. Um, I am trying to, um, I mean, share my screen also, but it's, okay, let me see, okay. I'm. I'm not able to start the video, but uh, I mean, we can fix this problem fairly along the way. So I'm starting my presentation, which will touch with you actually, uh, guys. Okay, now I can share my video and uh, three to one, here we, here we are. Hello everyone. So um, I'm Alessandro Volombo, the CEO and co-founder of Jure. Uh, and uh, in my uh, talk, I would like to wrap up uh, some key elements that both Rafael and Luigi took. Um, and uh, my idea with you for today is mainly to give you uh, to do a kind of step back and to be able to look at the blockchain and legal field from a wider perspective, to try to come together to some conclusions. First of all, before we start, just to, I mean, as a recap of what we said so far, um, what are smart contracts? You know already, they are code that runs on decentralized networks. Smart legal contracts are essentially uh, smart contracts that can be considered also according to the law of, of a specific jurisdiction, legal contracts. Therefore, they are legally binding and they can be enforced. And then ADR, of course, stands for Alternative Dispute Resolution. Um, Let's start with a broader question. Why blockchain and legal? Why this uh, vertical? Uh, let me try to explain the presentation. Probably you can see now that better, okay. Well, I was saying, uh, why blockchain and legal? This is a major question. Um, let's try to wrap up our conclusions in two fields. First of all, on the let's say the legal, the typical legal activity field also of lawyers, so you might be really interested. I think that one of the major improvements in the next years will be regarding the smart contracts area. Let me remind you that smart contracts don't mean uh, automation. They mean auditable automation. This is a key element because even today, a checkout on Amazon is automation of eventually a commercial relationship, but with smart contracts, you can have that kind of automation with auditability. 
still, um, in my, in our opinion, and to according to a lot of people in the legal tech space and blockchain experts, the journey of smart contracts will take some time. Even in the longer term, there will be a need of dispute resolution systems. And according to our point of view, for uh, having a mass adoption and therefore a possible replacement of paper contracts by smart contracts, there is also a need of a quite more complete Oracle system. The oracles will be the key, in our opinion. An oracle is any element that can introduce on a DLT, on a blockchain, and for the purpose of executing of a smart contract, an external element. Now, um, this is one area. There is also another area, which is related to uh, the justice sector. I can say even the public one, or public courts, and for sure, uh, regarding the dispute resolution by private entities, so any kind of ADR. The key element of transparency of blockchain, in our opinion, will be used in the future for dispute resolution processes. Let me give you just an idea and a, an example. For example, the appointment of a specific judge or of a specific arbitrator could happen in a few years, or maybe on our system that we are currently developing, thanks to a randomized algorithm. This could enhance you know, the chance of transparency and uh, therefore eventually to limit, to reduce hypotheses of corruptibility of the system, for example, I mean, in, in, in theoretical and practical terms. Also, as we have seen as so far with Luigi, some kind of new ODR systems, which are blockchain-based, could address the problem of micro-sized disputes that currently they do not have uh, any kind of reliable solution as per today. Um, let me give you an overview of what did happen as so far. What did happen exactly in this uh, new interesting blockchain world on the ADR, let's say justice, in, not in technical terms, and uh, blockchain. Um, since 2015, so one year after the Ethereum launch, um, a few projects started to work in the area of ADR. Which was the reason? The reason was that uh, smart contracts, especially at that time and then during the bubble of 2017, were absolutely uh, considered by a lot of people as a, the future of contracts. At that time, everyone, it, also some law firms, were writing, look guys, we are going to change completely the way we are going to work. But also at that time was clear that smart contracts can have two huge limits. The first limit is when there is a technical failure. If a smart contract is not reversible by definition, this could be a big problem. As you know, by your experience, since you, most of you are lawyers, in your I mean, day to day, you see, you experience how contracts must be reversed, reimbursed, reimbursements, failure, um, and so far and so far and so on. The second problem with smart contracts is subjectivity. This is a huge and major problem. The code, the dry code, can't assess subjectivity. If I will do a smart contracts or a legal contract, smart legal contract, sorry, with Luca for asking him to provide to me a new logo design, I need a logo for my new activity. Fantastic. How does it, how is possible that a smart contract manages this relationship where the beauty of the logo can't be assessed normally by pure code. How can a machine assess if the logo has been made properly? These two were, to be really short, the major problems that already in 2015, 2016, people started to talk about. And a few projects uh, popped up in the space with different kinds of solutions. Some of them are not any more active projects. Some of them like Pleros or Aragon or Az, Materium are in place. Some of them, they pivoted, changed some, including us partially, we expanded our reach. And uh, at that time, as Luigi was mentioning and showing you, there was one, one kind of main approach. The approach was um, to give you a clear idea 
coming, trying to uh, transpose from the blockchain and crypto world based more on economic incentives, the approach was to try to transpose that approach in a, an ODR approach. We call, just for the purpose to give you a clear concept, this approach like the one which is trying to decentralize, the, sorry, decentralizing the act of judgment. So as in the example that Luigi was showing you, including as Azure with the open layer platform, we tried and we are still testing with universities and people to build an ODR system for really small claims where a group of people like a jury can vote on one side or on the other. And according to the vote they express, they could be rewarded. This approach has been similar to some other projects. And uh, this model, of course, has one core principle. There is no written decision. There is no arbitrator. There is no one single judge, let's say. And therefore, it is not clear, at least in most of these projects, if there can be a typical, you know, right of defense expressed and guaranteed by the chance of the climate and the respondent to explain their own reasons by written means, for example. And it's not clear if there is, I mean, more advanced um, explanation and, and, and regarding the, um, the outcome of the, of the decision and so far and so on. This model can be discussed for really a lot. So if you want, you can ask me more in the question Q&A session. What I wanted to share with you is that clearly this model can be problematic for the current adoption at least. Why? Legally speaking, and I will, I mean, not mention the other problems, legally speaking, this is hardly uh, for almost every country and legal framework can be considered a real, you know, arbitration or at least something that can be considered, I mean, respecting the, the typical constitutional requirements for any other procedure. Of course, there are also practical problems. These models require critical masses of voters. And as a matter of fact, as per today, there are no that, that huge number of users of DApps, decentralized applications in the world. At the same time, we do believe that in the future, this will change. We do believe that maybe in five, 10, 15 years, who knows, these kind of solutions or some variations would bring a huge disruption, especially for micro disputes. That's our idea. That's why we talk about this topic in terms of micro justice as a future emerging trend. As entrepreneurs, as innovators, at the same time, we think that we should adopt strategies that can create these long-term benefits in a sustain sustainable way. We think that uh, the time ar has arrived for, I mean, um, also approaches that can build sustainable processes for projects like our and bring, uh, I mean, a progressive, you know, in, in innovation that start at the same time with solid foundations, which means to currently address a problem, to currently be able to solve in an efficient way, more efficient way, that problem. Um, that's why we um, at Dewar are finally releasing the second product that we are, uh, I mean, we mentioned in our first white paper with the name of Court Layer. And this product uh, solves the function to solve one, one, one major problem. I will go really short on this aspect. If you want, you can ask us more. And the idea, of course, is to take acquaintance of the massive problem that today exists for every kind of dispute, which is regarding medium or small uh, values, 50K, 100K, 150K. If you see the data of OECD, for every small or medium claim, let's say the disputes regarding normally the small and medium enterprises, almost in every country, almost in every country, they require a lot of money and a lot of time. And this creates a huge problem in terms of loss of GDP for the country and in terms, of course, of efficiency of the economical system. This data is also a bit, you know, we like to put this kind of concept together with another data. Of course, it's just an estimation 
46% they estimate of human beings live today under protection of the law. Part of this, of course, regards civil and administrative disputes. Other part of this estimation regards public and criminal law that we do not touch for sure. At the same time, 59% of the people today are estimated to have access to internet. So what we propose and we are finally uh, delivering is a new system. We uh, are delivering a um, platform, which is a multi-jurisdiction platform, which is 100% digital, and it covers 166 countries, as the institutional model uh, is legally recognized, at least in those 166 countries. The purpose of this platform is to allow the creation of digital arbitration chambers. We call them hubs. The idea is to provide a legally binding procedure in terms of arbitration, which hopefully guarantees the solution of a dispute in 30 days. It's clear that in case of technical consultancy activities required, this time frame can expand. It might be 60 days, it might be four months eventually. The costs of this procedure should be a bit less than the today alternatives. And the reason why stands from the fact that the entire procedure is fully digitalized. We use blockchain in this platform for some key and crucial aspects. For example, the random, randomized selection of the arbitrator or some advanced features of quality assessment of the arbitrator, because we do believe that, in our opinion, modern ADR systems should really solve the problem of quality assessment. How can we trust an arbitration panel which is online without knowing which exactly and specifically which is the betting system that it is, it is applied and which is the ongoing betting system that is applied every time an arbitrator issues a judgment. Our goal with this project is to open in the next month digital arbitration chambers with partners in uh, several countries. In the moment I'm speaking with you, we finalized agreements for at least seven jurisdictions from day one, and we will do uh, some testing activities during this autumn for providing a 10 times faster dispute resolution experience to the small and medium enterprises of these places. Uh, our partners are also some public institutions. This project is made also for supporting, you know, for alleviating the backlog of public course that is a problem, of course. And the spirit, the vision we do that is uh, the one of a progressive road to decentralization, which means that as a team as a company, we do not want to run those hubs. We look for partners that co-invest with us in doing that. And we will be both a technological provider and let's say a subject which has as a goal, the one to ensure the same standard, the same reliability, the same process. It's like a constitutional, let's say, guarantor of some key principles of this procedure. Of course, it's an arbitration procedure, so the uh, decisions are made legally binding. Um, I would like to stress out that I, the response we are uh, receiving in these months and weeks are, of course, positive. And uh, I think that uh, these activities are quite useful also, unfortunately, in the light of the problems and the new run for dig digitalization caused by the COVID. I hope that with my, I mean, short speech, I gave to you, um, first of all, a wider clarification of why blockchain is legal, about smart legal contracts and justice. I wanted to show you and give you just the input if you want to, of course, to expand with your own researches, the experience that in the world have been done on, in this um, area from 2015 up to today. I try to explain to you, therefore, a bit more the logic behind the decentralized, let's say, ODR proposals currently, you know, building up in the world. And at the same time, I try to explain to you the solution and the approach that we at Jure are trying to put in place, which is, uh, I mean, taking acquaintance of the need of sustainability and progressive you know, improvements based on solid elements and effective solutions as per today. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will be delighted to answer to your questions.
I'm trying to see if there are Q&A. Okay, it seems they are not. Maybe Luca, we can uh, wrap up some Q&A Q of- um, Yeah, Ale, first let's uh, leave the word for, to Jane. Uh, she will uh, take forward uh, her talk and we can do the Q&A session all together at the end. Excuse me, I think there's someone have questions to uh, Ali. Yeah, there is a question from King Yu. Um, so arbitrators, are those arbitrators selected by Jure? No, uh, this is a key element in our case. Yeah, sure, um, with, with pleasure. So um, if you're interested, we will be really, really glad to expand this point, but uh, in practical terms, there will be several hubs eventually one per country in the quite shorter, shortest term possible. It is going to be the hub admin, which is like the chairman of a digital arbitration chamber to do the betting. So as Jure, we do not select arbitrators. It will be the responsible of the hub to select those. Uh, on day one, the betting pro pro procedure will be based on titles, a minimum years of experience in the legal field, and also there will be a, a referral process. So um, the standard we are currently discussing with the current hub admins is to, for example, ask to anyone who applies to become an arbitrator three references, and uh, so that we try to be, I mean, to ensure a platform which is quite serious on the task. If you are interested about that, by the way, you're absolutely welcome to, to I mean, stay in touch. Sure, they are paid by the fees of the parties. So the business model is um, um, essentially for every dispute that, they, that it is assigned to an arbitrator, the arbitrator is paid by the party. So the, there is a um, fee sharing between arbitrator, juror, and the hub admin. Most of this fee goes, of course, to the arbitrator when there is a one single arbitrator or to the three arbitrators when the procedure is made with three arbitrators. So um, normally, um, according to the studies and the, all the simulations we did on 10 countries, uh, the fees to be paid is quite interesting for the arbitrator. And at the same time, it is considered as at least virtually for now, really affordable for the party. So to be really uh, clear, in, in case you, in someone becomes an arbitrator in the future, comfortably from, from the platform, they will be as, it, there will be a chance that they will be as, um, 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 assigned with the dispute resolution of a, of a um, dispute, and there will be a clear you know, uh, um, amount paid. This amount, of course, is, is paid in fiat money, in case the party, of course, paid in fiat, and uh, it is paid at the end of the procedure. So normally it will be after 30 or 60 days since the procedure started. Okay, if someone has more, oh, okay, here you go. Uh, if the case, oh, okay, no, I, I'm trying to, <laughs> uh, fun, I'm trying to, um, there is a, there are a lot of interesting questions from Ying, so I, I, um, I, I'm going forward. Thanks Ying for these, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the interest that you are showing, really, really appreciate it. So uh, you are touching, now Ying is asking, um, what does happen in case of a, a small amount dispute? How is the economic effectiveness being considered? So um, the standard we propose to every digital arbitration chamber, but again, the final decision is not on your, is to generally speaking ask as a fee for dispute resolution the 5% of the value of the dispute. So when you ask me this question, uh, uh, I mean, we have to analyze the target of disputes that a specific hub wants to, again, targeting, and uh, where the 5% of the dispute is too low, it might, might be a bit increased. Um, so just to give you an idea, some hubs that we are currently building up will be targeting disputes of at least 30K or 50K of value. So below that threshold, they probably won't be interested in solving the dispute. At the same time, there will be other hubs targeting only really small disputes, and they will try to be even faster in the dispute resolution procedure. 
Of course, um, not in the first month, but uh, for disputes below 10K, for example, $10,000, we as a platform and some hub admins will encourage only in that case lawyerless procedures. But why? Because normally, it depends on the country, but in most of the countries normally, if you have a dispute of $3,000, as per today, you probably will avoid to go before public courts. Of course, you will avoid to go before arbitration. And as a matter of fact, in some countries, there are no efficient solutions. In some countries, there are in place. So in, the, in, the, in case like this, for example, 3K disputes, there will be, I mean, um, most of the fee will go to the arbitrator and it will be higher than 5%. Um, we will encourage in that case to have an arbitrator which is going to also manage the dispute without lawyers. So you will have to do also, I mean, uh, another job, but it's which is the preparation and clarification of the, uh, you know, the claims talking with a single party. But the, we expect that to happen not before then um, Q2 2021. So um, on the first days, the first apps probably will target 30, 50K disputes at least, up to $1 million, and the fee will go, I mean, mostly to arbitrator. So if you are interested about that, you will please send us an email. We will be absolutely glad to keep you posted. Also, I mean, when you want about the chance to apply to become arbitrator in the upcoming apps. I think we are. Oh, hi, Ying. Yeah, uh, great to be in touch, actually. I'm, I don't know if we are in the same panel because I, I, I'm the deep, deep Tech Dispute Resolution panel of uh, Oxford as well. So happy to be in touch. And uh, let, yeah, let's chat later. Maybe we can, uh, <laughs> we can expand these, 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 these topics. But I really appreciated all these, these questions. Super. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. <laughs> thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, Luca, do you want to add anything? Oh, we just move on. Uh, I think, Jane, we can move on. Uh, you can touch maybe briefly, uh, you know, on the legal tax scenario in China, and then we can move with a very quick Q&A uh, session. Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I will make my speech in Chinese. Okay. Uh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> let me uh, share my... OK， 哎、hey, ，Hello， 嗯，大家好，那个呃，我今天为大家嗯、呃、分享的嗯、呃、话题是呃法律科技在中国的发展，就是 legal technology in China 那。那呃，我们今天分享的内容就是呃按照以下四个部分来进行，首先会给大家做一个呃简单的概述，就是目前在中国。呃、嗯，法律科技发展的一个基本情况，然后会为大家第二部分会为大家分析一下那个呃电子签名相关的一些法律影响。呃，第三个呢，我也会呃在就是为大家呃一起共同讨论一下那个智能合约 （smart contract）。嗯、呃，从从法律的角度怎么样来理解？然后第四个部分，那个呃我们也会呃与大家分享一下。区块链与争议解决，呃，或者我们叫那个 ODR， 呃的一个关系，然后一个呃在中国的一个应用。那呃，首先我们说，嗯、呃，法律科技的一个呃发展，那个嗯、呃，在不久的以前，呃，那个嗯、呃，法律对科技的关注可能还仅仅是聚焦于我们如何利用法律手段。为新技术发展的企业
，或者是新技术发展的应用带来的一个挑战，保驾护航，呃，或者是嗯、呃，为他们的融资提供服务，为他们的监管进行，也为他们的一个嗯、呃、政策提供一些监管措施，那个啊、呃，但是随着新技术的不断发展，逐渐的渗透到各行各业，其实法律与科技的结合已经成为显著发展趋势。嗯，所以嗯，科就是法科技为法律的发展和进化也开辟了新的天地。那我们说，嗯，法律科技，呃，是是一个什么概念呢？呃，我们可以把它看成为，就是说，嗯嗯，一个可以呃提高法律服务，或者是呃法律服务的效率，或者是体验的呃一个科技的平台。或者是一个科技的服务系统。那我们前面也开场的时候也提到了那个 A B C D， 就是 A I、Blockchain、Cloud、Big Data， 嗯、呃，这些新技术、新应用、新业态的发展，都使得呃法律科技的边界实际上是不断的拓展，而且也不断的有不断的夯实的这个法律科技产品的一些细节。那那个啊、嗯，所以呃，技术革命也给法律。带来了一场自动化、数字化、智能化的变革。刚才，呃，前面几位嘉宾也为我们分享了，嗯、呃，在那个，嗯，在欧洲包括全球的有一些，嗯，进展。所以，我们说法律和科技结合，呃，已经融合更加深入了，这样是一个，呃，互相影响，呃，共同发展、彼此成就的一个过程。那，呃，我们说目前，嗯、呃。我们说那个啊，目前法律的活动，那个在中国的情况呢，其实呃，也也也是有非常蓬勃的一个发展的状况。那我们这里面列了几个呃典型的呃相关的公司。那这个我们知道，这个易签宝和法大大，嗯、呃，它是提供电子合同的相关服务的，包括电子签名，还有电子合同的模板啊，电子证据的存证啊，相关的服务。那那个啊，李迈和法狗狗呢？它是致力于通过 AI 与法律的结合，通过大数据 AI 来，呃，进行一些个法律的检索呀，还有整理资料，还有提供一个简单的咨询。通过大大数据的分析，呃，大数据通过呃通过大数据分析采信率呀，还有那个呃案件的结案结果来做出一个更好的判断。那这是嗯。呃这是跟那个，嗯，我们说，呃，签名啊，还有，呃，法律服务相关的。那这个 d e f a u l t 是什么呢 d e f a u l t 它其实是一个那个，嗯，是一个，嗯，开放式的金融协议堆栈。怎么说呢？就是说，呃 d e f a u l t 它是一个在已经在区块链上的一堆，呃，智能合约。那它实际上主要用于，嗯、呃。主要是用在，嗯，金融方面，所以它实际上我们说叫开放式金融，就是，呃 ，decentralized finance， 就是那个啊，去中心化的金融。那主要是在这方面的一个呃、啊、使用。呃、啊，我们为什么要在这里提它呢？就是实际上，呃，那个呃、啊，实际上这个 decentralized 的这个呃呃 finance， 呃，发展也很。发展也很快，然后他们有很多的呃合约是值得我们也要进，就是法律人士也要进行一个研究的。那其实从这些方面来看呢，我们看法律科技的发展大概是，嗯，经就是有这样的三个阶段。那第一个阶段呢，就是啊、呃、是一个法律信息，呃或者我们说呃是一个法律信息和诉讼流程的这样一个数字化和在线化的一个发展。比如说，我们中国的那个互联网法院，那实际上我们现在已经呃成立了三个互联网法院，就是杭州互联网法院，啊，还有北京互联网法院，还有广州互联网法院。那这个那个嗯、呃，是一个嗯、呃，主要是在呃信息和呃流程方面的数字化和在线化。然后第二个发展阶段呢，就是我们实际上呃，就是法律服务的一个啊、呃、智能化和自动化。啊、呃，其实这里面呢，就是主要就我们运运用到了 AI 和那个嗯大数据的一个呃、嗯、技术，那个啊、嗯，所以通过 AI 和大数据的发展。
我们现在基本上也可以在一定程度上是可以实现啊，比如说合同或者判决书的法律文件的自动生成，呃，或者是案件结果的预测，或者甚至是呃，甚至是合同的审查，呃，智能化法律咨询。嗯，可以精准的。其实我们现在就是呃呃，在某种程度上是已经可以呃做做到一个呃精准提供一个精准的法律服务了。就像我们中伦，其实我们今年也出了一个通过大数据的分析，分析那个上市公司同业竞争的一个、呃、一个报告，也是呃也是其实也是用运用了这个啊、呃、法律技术。那这个也是我们这是我们说的第二个阶段，可能是呃法律活动的。一个智能化、自动化的这样的一个过程，那在发展到第三个阶段，其实就是我们刚才提到的那个呃法律代码化的，就是 code。我们一直说 code is the law， 就是这个代码它开始承担一定的法律功能，所以这也是我们为什么要提那个 default。第，等一下我们在后面可能还会再嗯、呃、讲讲这个德菲相关的一些呃事情。那这个代码。现在的就是代码可能已经不仅仅是用来执行一个法律的规则，其实它也是会用来，呃，创造一个法律的规则，或者是来解释一个法律的规则。所以那个呃，就是进一步的发展，可能呃，尤其是 blockchain， 使得这个更加有了可能性。那我们可能更加呃，要关注这方面的情况。呃，尤其是现在呃，现在新的发展趋势就是呃。更加多元化，我们法律科技是发展更加多元化，而且，嗯、呃，那个呃，法治化、全球化的情况。那这个是我们的那个呃，法律科技在中国的发展现现状。那个呃，我们可以看到，其实呃，我们国家的法律科技，呃，在二零一二年的时候，我们基本上是是没有专利，到一三年也没有什么发展。这个时候实际上是，呃，一三年那个呃，比特币出来。就是 blockchain 开始被大家逐渐的认识，然后到二零一六年，我们呃那个啊，全球有五百七十九个专利，我们也有将近两百个专利了。到二零一八年，我们就迅速已经上升到啊、呃，就是全球变成九百三十三个专利的时候，我们已经上升到四百七十五个专利了。我们可以看到，就是说很多的技术的呃团队也开始关注这个法律这个领域，嗯，所以可能在法律科技的方面。嗯，也开始逐渐增加了那个专利的申请数量。那我们说这个专利申请数量也是一定程度上可以，呃，作为一个我们判断，呃，这个呃技术发展的情况的一个标杆标签吧。那我们说那个呃，我们一直说这个新技术，呃，那新技术跟我们法律比较紧密相关的部分，其实就是呃我们一直提到的。呃呃 ，A B C D 都是相关的。那那个啊、呃，说人工智能呢，就是因为其实呃，人工智能的应用已经有有很多公司可以通过人工智能来呃进行律师的选择，呃，包括进行一些案例的梳理，嗯、呃，甚至呃案例的梳理，推荐律师，或者是那个啊、呃，或者是嗯，通过人工智能呃来分析嗯。呃来进行一个嗯，就是法法规的搜索。那通过大数据呢，我们我们知道，就是有些大数据的应用使得嗯那个嗯，就比如说有一些案件，嗯，经过大数据的分析以后，对于案件的呃、嗯、审审判的一个结果的推测，实际上都是可以实现的。那个啊、嗯，所以我们看到新技术对法律的嗯行业其实提出了很大的挑战。那那个啊，我们说 blockchain 这个啊，就是更加是因为 blockchain 刚才那个啊，前面几位嘉宾也分享了，就是嗯、呃，尤其是阿里提到了 decentralization， 就是那个去中心化的这样一个概念，那可能通过 blockchain， 嗯、呃，就是可以实现实现这样的一个呃可能性。那那个啊，这个也对对律师行或者对法律行业也是一个巨大的挑战。因为其实律师行业还是，呃，有一点中心化的呃意思的。那那个啊、嗯，那还有就是我们提到，其实呃，电子签名呢也是一个啊、呃，也是一个呃科，也随着科技的发展，也会也是有了一些一些变化。所以包括我们刚才提到的前面的
呃，易珠宝啊，就是呃，易签宝啊，法大大，就是这些电子签名公司，其实他们的技术也在从从最早的那个呃，只是互联网上，呃，那个互联网上的一个呃签名，呃，发展到那个呃，利用 blockchain 或者是利用其他更先进的技术，那个呃，来进行电子签名的一个操作。那个嗯、呃，那我们说，嗯、呃，这些新技术。和我们的法律之间的关系，那我们是有有一个原则。那我们这个原则呢，就是技术中立的原则，就是 technology neutral。这个原则呢是就是是什么意思呢？就是说我们对新技术的应用，呃，是采用技术中立原则的。那个啊，我们不会因为新技术的采用而影响法律效力。就是我们的法律一般是规定的是一个事件。那个啊，并不会因为你使用不同的工具而使得这个事件的结果啊产生不同的认识。所以这个这个话题就是啊，这样一个原则怎么样适用呢？等一下我们讲到智能合约的时候，再给大家做一个啊仔细的分析。那我们说在那那,那个这是这是一个啊技术中立的原则。那我们在那个啊司法实践中，那个啊当然就是要进行积极的探索。包括司法机关和法律行业，呃，都应该积极的参与到这个新科技在法律实务中的应用。就像我们刚才也已经跟大家分享了，其实，嗯、呃，在那个呃，在中国呃目前的现状，尤其是那个呃，就是呃这个，嗯、呃，这个病毒发生期间，其实那个呃互联网法院也起了很大的作用。所以我们现在呃，实际上，嗯、呃，就是嗯。呃在线的那个呃，在线的法律的救济方式，其实已经在中国已经得到了一定的应用吧。那接下来我们先为大家分享一下呃，电子签名的呃，电子签名的一些呃相关法律问题。首先，我们说这个电子签名是那个呃，在呃是。是有一个中中国人中华人民共和国电子签名法，那我们这个法律实际上在二零零四年就已经呃首次发布了，所以这个电子签名本身并不是一个新鲜的东西，只是说在二零零四年的时候可能技术手段是不一样的，所以那个呃电子签名法在二零一五年做过一次修订，然后二零二零一九年去年呃又做过一次第二次修订，那这是呃现在我们看到的。最新的是那个一九年四月二十三日发布实施的。那我们看到这里面就是呃提到了，就是电子签名，呃，他对电子签名是有一个定义的，就是用数据电文以电子形式所含所赋予识别签名人身份，表明签名人认可其中内容的一个数据。其实它还是一个数据，就是我们这个呃是是那个呃，相当于是一个。呃，如果是我们是智能合约，或者是我们一个呃传统世界的纸质文件，嗯、呃，传到那个呃线上以后，呃，有有这样一个呃，通过这样的一个数据来确认这个呃文件形式的一个呃一个，就是等于是一一一一个呃形式一个呃呃工具，那个呃，那我们说呃。这个电子签名可以适用于什么样的合同？那大家可以看到，它是适用于商业合同是没有问题，但是适用于跟人身有关系的合同，那就嗯是是不可以适用的，这是中国的法律规定的。然后当然也呃对于那个嗯公用事业服务的一部分也是啊、呃、禁止适也是禁止适用那个嗯电子签名的。那我们是。就看一下那个啊，可靠的电子签名的一个生效要件，那是是怎么样规定的？呃，首先是要有，是要能够识别是电子签名人的专有。那个啊，这个嗯、啊，我们的电子签名的那个啊，呃，服务商，就我们刚才提到的呃，易签宝什么，他们都是呃可以做到，就是要电子签名人专有，然后要由电子签名人控制，他可以自由使用的，那个啊，也不会被别人拿来使用。签署后对电子签名的任何改动是要能够被发现的，这个也是呃很重要。这也是为什么呃 blockchain 这个区块链这个技术被使用以后，其实那个嗯、呃、是很受欢迎
那个啊、呃，就是很多呃电子签名的系统也是利用了 blockchain 的这样一个特征，它这呃不易篡改的这样的一个特征，所以那个嗯、呃，这个这个也是呃电子签名的一个很重要的生效要件，就是呃。当然，电还有还有那个啊，第四个就是说，嗯、呃，签署后对嗯、呃、电子文件内容的改动也要能够被发现。那这个啊、呃，目前的那个啊、呃、电子签名呃技术提供商应该基本上都是没实现这样的呃功能都是没有问题。那个啊、呃，他们都提供了，其实呃很多平台都可以提供多样化的电子签名服务。嗯，也可以提供一些呃、嗯、相关的，甚至是呃印模呀，或者是、嗯、那个啊，反正保护客户隐私的一些啊一些服务，在这方面其实中国的发展是已经是嗯蛮先进的了。那个呃、嗯，接下来呢是呃、嗯、跟大家啊分享一下关于智智能合约的我们的一些思考。那首先刚才。呃，嗯 ，Rafael 和那个呃，艾丽都讲了智能合约的问题。那我们说呃，智能合约的一个基本原理，那个啊、呃，就是刚才那个 Rafael 也先生也提到了，说是智能合约是一个是一串计算机的代码。那个啊、呃，那我们也认为，呃，确实它是一个呃，是是一是一串计算机的代码。那个嗯、呃，那实实际。实际上就是我们原来的传统的合同条款，就是我们也知我们也知道，我们大家都做做律师啊、法律工作者，我们知道我们很多合同其实也是一环套一环的，也是如果什么条件怎么样，然后然后应该嗯、呃、怎么样那个执行，也是很多是这样的逻辑性的那个嗯、呃、安排，所以说那个啊、呃、也可以通过一个计算机代码来实现。那这是呃，我们说智能合约主要是它是一个呃实现这样一个呃操作的一个计算一串计算机代码，然后要部署在区块链上。那个当然就是呃部署在区块链上以后，因为利用区块链不可篡改的这个啊、呃、特性，同时经过各方签署，就是我们刚才说，因为现在电子签名在在各个国家就是不同的 jurisdiction 可能就是不同的呃法律。对他的呃法律规定可能不一样，但是嗯，基本上都是承认这个电子签名的呃效力的。所以那个啊、呃，我们国家也是承认，就刚才我们讲到的，所以他经过各方签署以后呢，可以在区块链上呃自动运行。这个就是嗯、呃，这是这是还有智能合约，还有一个很重要特点就是它要呃预设条件，就是只有只就是在条件成立的时候啊、呃，这个呃合同会生效。然后会自动运行，就我们下面说它会自动执行。这个自动执行呢，因为在是部署部署在区块链上，所以它是一个必然的、不可逆的这样的一个情况。所以区块链代码一旦编写完成上链以后，智能合约就会不可逆的自动运行，而不考虑现实情况的变化。那这就是呃呃那个呃技术的人提出来 ，code is the law， 就是他们写好 code 以后，这就已经是规则了，你只能按照规则进行。也是为什么我们看到很多呃，德非就是刚才我们提到的那个啊，嗯、呃，就是我们刚才提到 decentralized finance， 他们呃一系列的那个嗯，合同、金融合同的嗯，金融合同的制备，就是作为以智能合约的形式出现的。那那我们说呃，从我们法律人的角度来看，智能合约和我们说的合同呃。合同法下的合同是什么关系呢？呃，那我们其实我们认为呢，首先合同法律合同法的合同法下的合同对合同的记载形式是没有特，就是呃，那如果是书面形式和或者是呃口头形式，在形式上没有特别约定说不可以通过呃计算机代码的这个电子的这个啊、呃、数据来实现，所以这我们认为这个是。呃，我们的计算机代码实际上是合同记载的一种一种形式。那那个，嗯，我们计算机这个呃、啊、智能合约的一个很重要特点是，它在条件预设成功的时候是可以自动执行，所以它是提供了一个嗯一个比较呃、嗯、特别的执行方式的安排。那怎么样那个啊，我们来认定这个智能合约
，它是不是一个合同成立、合同关系成立呢？这个是要根据各个国家的法律，就嗯、呃，大部分法律的那个法律都是认为，如果这个智能合约的所有的条件条件都满足嗯、呃、当地合同法对合同要件的一些规定。那我们就可以把这个呃智能合约视为一个合同关系，合同关系成立。那这个合同关系是不是成立，对我们法律的人士来说是非常重要的，因为只有合同关系成立了，我们接下来执行如果出现了问题，去进行争议解决，进行仲裁，这个才有一个基础。但那个啊，但是接下来我们就带来的问题就是说啊，那如果呃 smart contract 有 bugs， 那怎么办呢？那个啊，就像我们呃，其实呃，前一阵子德飞出现了很多问题，那个啊，就是被黑客攻击，然后使得那个啊，使得客户和平台都都遭受了巨额的损失。那在这种情况下，我们这个法律救济是应该怎么样来，是是是应该采用什么样的法律手段来对这样的情况进行救济呢？这个实际上是。也是我们应该，哎，就是嗯，思考的问题。那个啊、嗯，最近我们也是写了一篇这方面的文章。那我们认为可能可以有，呃呃，从两个角度来谈这个啊、呃、救济的问题。首先是说民事救济，那我们可以建议是不是可以约定管辖？我们知道那个啊、呃，在 smart contract 制备在那个啊、呃、区块链上以后，它是一个。在网上的一个情况，所以很难确定使用人的那个啊，在什么在什么地方，所以在这个管辖权的那个啊，在管辖权的管管辖权的确定问题上，其实是提出了挑战的。所以我们建议，是不是或者是呃，在智能合约里，或者是通过某一个手段，可以呃，大家形成一个嗯、呃、对管辖权的一个约定，那个嗯、呃，就是我们提出一些。呃，一些思考，供大家一起来探讨。然后那个啊、呃，第二个呢，我们建议说，是不是可以对增加责责任方的责任？那因为呃，那个嗯、呃，因为虽然是由于黑客的呃攻击，呃，导致了那个啊，呃，导致 smart contract 执行，嗯，导导致 smart contract 造成重大的损，造造成客户的重大损失。嗯，但是项目方因为作为他提供 smart contract 的这个项目方，那个啊，你对这个就是这个技术的这个合约是不是有一个责任？那比如说我们其实啊，我们知道现在对这个技术的这个 smart contract 是有一个，也是有一个那个代码审计的。这样的一个呃活动，但是代码审计公司和项目方之间实际上有一定的利益冲突。呃，代码审计公司提出的建议，项目方是不是会采纳？如果没有采纳，由此造成的法律后果，由此如果导致了客户的损失，造成的法律后后果，是不是可以寻求救济？所以这些法律问题，嗯、呃，其实都是空白，嗯、呃，所以都是需要那个啊、呃，我们法律人士呃来来研究这这个相关的问题的。那当然，我们也提出，就是如果是呃黑客，当然应该承担侵权责任，嗯，但是那我们要能找到黑客才好才行。那个我们知道，在那个嗯区块链上，那个嗯呃就是区块块链的区块链的匿名性的特点，可能也会使得呃寻找寻找到这个黑客是呃非常困难的。那呃另外一个那个，如果是跳出我们这个智能合约的这个呃。角度，我们说这样的一个商业模式上面，我们可是不是可以通过呃购买一种商业保险的方式，呃，来实现那个嗯，就是 smart contract 的一个救济？那这这是我们想到的，可以可以提出来的一些思考的方法、思考的方向。那对于监管机关的那个嗯监怎么样来监管这个 smart contract 的执行，就是其实嗯。是，其实现在这样的事情实际上已经在发生了。那那个啊，我们说，首先你这个德飞就是作为，如果是一个金融，嗯，金做金融，提供金融业务，提供金融的那个啊，呃 ，smart contract 的一个执行一个服务，那我们认为是不是应该有一个啊监管牌照监管，就是要有一个要有申请一个 license。当然，那个啊，当然那个，嗯，项目方和那个啊，和用户可能都有责任要配合警方的追查。呃，另外，我们认为是不是因为呃，我们这个 smart contract 是制备在呃项目方的那个嗯、呃、区块链上，同时由项目方来负责发布。嗯、呃，而且项目方在这个。
对对这个代码，它是嗯有更深刻的认识。那个啊、嗯，用户可能是没有概念的，因为用户并不不是一个技术的人，也不会去研究那个啊、嗯，就是这个 contract 到底是怎么写的，到底有没有问题。那所以在这种情况下，我们说是不是可以考虑举证责任倒置？这个嗯。Burden of proof 是不是应该是加在那个项目方的身上？这是我们对这个嗯智能合约法律漏洞的一些呃法律救济的一个嗯思考。那那个呃、嗯、接下来呢，我们就是谈一下那个啊、嗯、区块链存证和争议解决的问题。那我们说呃、嗯、区块链存证的应用目前在国内实际上还蛮多的，就是法院啊、仲裁庭啊，其实也都积极的参与了这个啊。呃，这方面的安排就是那个啊，就是区块链存存证，就是利用了区块链不可篡改的这样一个特性，所以它是非常有利的那个啊，一个取证的呃，非常有利的一个啊，技术使得取证是非常便捷。那我们知道，其实嗯、呃，除了刚才我们提到的那个啊，那三个。呃，互联网法院就是杭州、杭州互联网法院、北京互联网法院和广州互联网法院。其实广州仲裁委也也做了一，也推出了一个那个呃仲裁的呃联盟链，那个嗯、呃，它也是可以在线上做做这样一个呃仲裁的安排，那个嗯、呃、是可以进行区块链的存证的。那我们说区块链的存证的一些呃技术特点呢，那个一般呢它都是采用联盟链。就是它会有一些呃链接法法院啊、仲裁机构啊或者公证机构啊、司法鉴定机构呀、啊。我看到也有一些人提出来，就是那个区块链存证的跟法院的这个链上面，应该也有一些律师呃律师事务所来参与那个啊作为联盟链的节点。嗯，那那个啊这方面其实也是可以寻求嗯。呃寻寻求参与的，那那个啊、呃，那这个地方呢，我要提一下，就是和我们安利刚才帮我们介绍的，呃，那个啊 j e r 的情况是不一样的，就是 j e r 是一个 decentralized justice， 就是我们可以看到它是一个去中心化的一个链，那个啊、呃，实际上就是我们说是一个公链。那和我们这里的链呢，我们是一个联盟链，就是有有一些节点来一起参与的，还是比较中心化的。那个啊，那这也是一个中国的特色。那个啊，我们说，嗯，这是这是联盟链。然后第二点当然是不可篡改，就是这是区块链的一个啊很重要的特征。那个还有就是一个加密算法，通过加密算法以后，呃，加密之后，那个也不会泄密，也是可以，嗯。保护隐私的，这也是一个很重要的区块链的特征。那个啊，当然可以实现分布式存储。那这个是那个啊，就是整个存证技术是利用了区块链的一些重要的特点来进行一个嗯、啊，来来进行这样的一个安排。所以我们可以看到那个啊，基本上区块链的它的本身的一个特点，使得。呃，从证据方面，从尤其是存证方面，实际上是有非常有是是非常有利的。那我们说，嗯、呃，电子证据的范围，我们刚才提到了，说那个，嗯、呃，要进行存证，存存证呢，就是呃，要涉及到哪些是属于电子证据是可以可以存证的。这个我们是有那个啊，呃，民事诉讼法有专门的啊、呃、明确规定的，就是我们前面这里面提到的这些。呃，这些内容就是啊，网页博客啊，这个我就不为大家呃仔细念了，就是大家是可以看得到，呃，主要也是一些电子呃电子信息。然后那个、啊、我们说电子电子证据的生效要件，这个就是说啊、呃，实际上就是怎样证明这个电子证据电子证据的真实性。那我们说其实刚才也看到了。嗯，这个部分来看到，电子证据并不必然是存在区块链上的，所以我们刚才说区块链存证是你如果存在区块链上，那可以有这样那样，有有这些特点。但是如果那个啊、嗯，但不是必然存在区块链上，所以电子证据本身在那个法律规定里，它是有一定的呃生效要件的，这是在我们那个啊民事诉讼法呃若干规定里面
是有一个生效要件的，就是你怎样证明它的真实性。那那个呃，一个是你这个提供提供电子证据的这个平台是要有一个呃系统也要可靠性，然后运行状态正常，数据完整性啊、呃，主体适当性等等，还有呃鉴定和勘验要有这样一些呃因素保证它你这个呃真实性。那当然呃验证的手段，我们说这也也是明确规定，我们这边有一个嗯、呃、有。那个法律是明确指出了一个是存证平台、可信时间戳、哈希值校验，还有就是区块链。所以，如果是存在区块链上，法律是明确认可电子存证的效力的、真实性的效力的。啊，这个我就不为大家解释，因为刚才呃，阿里已经呃为我们那个呃详细的讲述了这个 j i 的一个呃具体的情况。那个嗯、呃，那我。那个我为大家分享的内容就到这里。那个呃，接下来大家有什么问题，呃，我们可以一起来，嗯、呃，一起来，嗯、呃，探讨。那个呃，包括呃，大家如果对嗯、呃、其他的那个啊、呃、演讲者有问题，也可以一起提出来，我们来呃十十分钟的一个那个嗯，哎、呃，一个 Q&A。Hello。Hello, hello, Jane. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, before moving to the Q and A uh, session, I just wanted to say uh, one thing to all the attendees, and is that uh, we have a WeChat group uh, with Jur, and that we will be sharing all our presentation and slides in the WeChat group. So uh, I just wanted to share with the audience the QR code. So they can uh, easily scan it and uh, and join the conversation in the WeChat group. Okay, now uh, it's time for the Q and A final session. So please, uh, all the team, uh, come on stage and also Jane and uh, Luca. Do you want to lead this session? Sure, uh, with pleasure. Um, before starting, just a message from uh, Jur as a as a whole team. Um, as you know, uh, we work uh, on VeChain uh, Blockchain, which is a Chinese uh, company. So for us, it's really a pleasure. And thank you so much, uh, Jane, for organizing and hosting the webinar with us. Uh, it's really an immense pleasure to be in touch with the Chinese community. This was uh, the first one of these kind of activities that we want to try to do together. Uh, so thanks for that. I think we can indeed say that today has been successful. Uh, it shows also from the questions and uh, now we'll be doing this uh, Q&A. Um, so without further ado, I'll just take it for, forward one question that uh, Raymond uh, Zhu asked uh, before because it was really an interesting one. And uh, I think it's uh, good if we spend a bit more time on that. Uh, so Raymond asked, uh, the smart contract can be very useful in terms of execution upon conditions that are met. So automatic execution, certainty, mass applications, uh, mass application, and so on. However, variation of smart contract can be difficult because as we've been talking throughout this session, we, we always use the concept of immutable, immutable contra uh, contracts, right? So we, we, we use that concept to explain smart contracts. So Raymond is asking, in practice, we lawyers will always encounter contracts assigned, terminated, amended, and so on and so forth. So how smart contracts could accommodate the changes where needed? That's a great question, uh, Raymond. Uh, and it's a problem that uh, smart contracts indeed have, because once you create a smart contract and you, you activate it, uh, then that's the software. That's the contract. Okay, There is no uh, turnaround or looking back. Um, but there are a couple of uh, points uh, that we need to address in that sense. One is that uh, smart contracts are immutable, but they, do, they can memorize data, they can store data. For example, the status of the contract, if the contract has been ongoing, if it's terminated for any reason, and so on and so forth. This type of uh, data, of course, changes in the contract. So the smart contract itself being immutable its data can change, okay, according to, of course, the specification of the contract. So the smart, the smart contract is a software, it has some functions. According to those functions, the data can change. It's, it can't change for any other function than the ones that are in the contract. Okay, that's first point. 
Uh, the second point is that the developers community, the tech community, it's working on creating upgradable smart contracts in such a way that if you create one smart contract today, for example, for a lease agreement for one of your clients or something like that, or a real estate purchase, uh, potentially we can deploy. Uh, so the, the contract goes live, the smart contract goes live, but uh, say that you need to add another clause to it or another behavior, or you need to uh, amend an existing behavior. We are currently as a overall developers community globally, we are studying solutions to uh, bring that smart contract into a new smart contract. So there will be a link between the previous version and the new version so that you know that the new version has originated from the previous one. Okay. And that's very important because we need a chain between the old smart contract and the new one. Otherwise, you'll be losing all the data that we stored on the previous smart contract. So it's very important uh, that we address that issue, right? Because otherwise you'll be losing data and the transactions that were uh, related to the uh, previous contract. I hope this answers the question, Raymond. It's an open topic and still under uh, works. And uh, I'll also address quickly the one regarding cryptocurrencies. Yes, these ODR systems, of course, they, move, they do need to support as many options as possible because that's how you create adoption, right? If your client, uh, think of your law firm, right? If your clients wants to pay in uh, USD rather than uh, Chinese one, they need to, you need to be flexible because it's their uh, will, their decision in the end. So you need to provide them as many options. do need to do the same. In JOR, we started from the JUR token. Um, so that's, uh, of course, uh, you know, a choice that we had to make uh, because we can't uh, start from day one with everything. But uh, gradually, we, are, we want to support more uh, crypto assets. And uh, for the solutions that we are, the new product that Alessandro has briefly mentioned regarding the legally binding multi-jurisdiction open justice platform, that platform will support also fiat currency payment. So you as a and then there will be a translation, an exchange rate happening basically under the hood without the client being, you know, it doesn't need to aware, be aware and worry about holding tokens and so on and so forth. So that's like a transparent mechanism that we have, uh, we are building right now. Okay, I would ask to um, Jane, uh, Luigi, and Alessandro to, uh, you, you can uh, unlock your video so that everyone can see you. And we'll be starting a very quick session in though because we have been uh, so long, there were questions in the middle, so um, we don't want to, uh, you know, take this uh, too long, but uh, uh, I'll start with, um, a very generic question for you, uh, Jane, because uh, we know that legal tech industry in China is in its infancy. It's, uh, you know, it's not like a mainstream uh, movement. Um, but for those that are here today, uh, those are really like an, like an elite, an exception to the rule. Uh, lawyers that are, be, that are interested on what's happening on the technology side. Um, I would like to ask you your point of view on this, like uh, how do you think you know legal technology and especially blockchain technology can you know um, move forward in China? And for those colleagues of yours that, for example, today are present in the webinar, uh, other lawyers, Chinese lawyers, how can they keep up with the latest developments, latest improvement? Uh, is there really a need for them to be updated constantly about what's happening on the technology field, or? Can they just, uh, you know, ignore what's happening, maybe outsource it to someone else and then get the information from them? What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, of course, you, you know, uh, in my opinion, it's very important to uh, uh, follow, you know, very important and necessary to follow the trends of the development of legal tech, right? Because uh, I do. <laughs> and, I think um, sometimes I, I worry like uh, if AI will take over some legal work and uh, if like big data will, uh, you know, also do a lot of work, uh, then lawyer may, you know, have to change your, uh, like your uh, work behavior. Uh, so um, sometimes I think about it 
also uh, with the blockchain, um, especially, you know, uh, now in China, actually we have, like I mentioned in my uh, speech, we have uh, online code, we have three online codes now, and also one um, local arbitration, online arbitration uh, blockchain, blockchain as well. So it's de developing very fast. It's, it's not like, you know, something new actually. And it, it, most of them are also, um, you know, um, supported by um, some famous legal tech companies. So it, 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 it's as actually, um, it, it's also booming in, in China, but maybe for lawyers, um, lawyers have different point of view on the technology. Uh, for the tech, technology guys, engineering, they will, they, they like to like do a FinTech, legal tech, tech, you know, every tech. But for, so for lawyers, maybe uh, they, they, they don't, like lawyers don't uh, know very well about technology, so um, not to care about it. But now I know many young lawyers are key to uh, know more and uh, you know want to join uh, the trend. Also for the um, blockchain, it's mainly it's decentral. I think the essence of blockchain is decentralization, but uh, it cannot you know make it happen in China now. So. Uh, we will see. And uh, also, um, if people are interested in the legal tech, um, you know, uh, legal tech um, trend, you can uh, actually learn, you can get information, collect the information from uh, some official uh, WeChat official account, uh, like uh, Tang Sen Lu Tou, Fa Lu Qian, and uh, some uh, West Law database official uh, accounts, and also uh, um, legal minor, uh, those kind of, you know, uh, legal, uh, those kind of WeChat official accounts can provide uh, many informations. Okay, thank you, Luca. Thank you so much, Jane. I hope that. Uh, uh those interested have taken note. Um, I'll ask uh, um, a question to Alessandro and maybe also Luigi and you can uh, uh, give your comments um, regarding, uh, you know, we have talked about ODR, online justice, online system, and a jurisdiction like China uh, that has moved, as you mentioned, Jane, uh, already ahead uh, when it comes to online proceeding. Uh, I wanted to ask to Alessandro, uh, given that most instead of the rest of the world is uh, lacking this kind of solutions, um, do you think a platform like the Open Justice uh, of Jure uh, can be helpful in some way in China as well? Or do you see like a potential, uh, you know, collaboration that uh, Jure could do with the local authority in which, you know, we can provide a few more efficiency or a better platform or something like that? What do you uh, feel regarding this? Uh, yeah, so thanks, Luca, for, for the question. I, I would say that, uh, I mean, general, in general terms, uh, China seems really advanced in terms of technology um, also usage in the legal field and specifically in the dispute resolution field. So that said, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, probably it would be interesting to understand how the, um, you know, the smaller sides of claims are managed so maybe in that niche for that aspect, that could be a, a point of you know uh, intersection between uh, um, two areas that could be eventually mutually um, you know um, satisfactory. Uh, at the same time, of course, there is a, a thing which uh, we are aware of that uh, I mean compared to other jurisdictions, the Chinese one require. Um, I mean, the dispute resolution is not uh, available for any private individual. There must be a different you know, setup. So that's why probably, yes, cooperating with some already existing entity would be absolutely great. 
Thanks, Ale. Uh, Luigi, any thoughts on this? Maybe on the, you know, generally this uh, online solution, tech solutions are um, the speed of adoption from, you know, courts. I mean, we've seen this in other jurisdiction. Of course, we are not that familiar with China, but, you know, the speed of adoption of this solution is quite uh, slow, generally. What, what are your thoughts on that? How we can uh, improve uh, how can lawyers, for example, give their contribution to, you know, maybe uh, bring awareness of this, uh, of these new possibilities? Okay, I believe that uh, for sure, as um, Alessandro said, collaboration with authorities are important, but also uh, the, um, the way lawyers can push for the adoption is way too important because as a lawyer, once you realize, let's say, that you can start an, arbit an arbitration uh, by just staying before your monitor, by just filing an online request without traveling and so on and so forth, you are providing the same product to your clients, like the same, let's say, consultancy product to your clients, but you reduce cost, you reduce time. And so even if maybe at the end of the day, you end up asking for a lower, a lower payment to your customers, but it becomes easier for you to manage more requests for arbitration, you know? And so for lawyers, this could be extremely useful, but at the end of the day, if you think of users and users, I mean, it's also useful for them because if I'm the manager, okay, of a small, medium enterprise, and I'm struggling to evolve my own business, I want to dedicate most of my time for expanding my business, not for dealing with disputes. And so I would prefer to avoid traveling or being involved in complex procedures with many frictions. So I believe that this kind of platform also in China could be useful for reducing frictions. That's how you improve adoption, by eliminating frictions, by showing that this is just a way, it's easier way for handling things and the most convenient ones, also from a financial standpoint. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, what are your thoughts, Jane, on this uh, aspect? Um, I think it, it, it actually, it, it depends, probably, uh, especially for uh for international cases uh maybe uh, it, it it's not lawyers say but for for local cases um like i mentioned we already have some online codes and also online arbitration blockchain thing and i I'm, I'm sure there are more will come so uh, later people may uh, you know get used to it will like will like to use it yeah i think as well that uh, cross border uh, transactions international transactions could be uh, uh, a good use case for this type of solution and uh, that makes uh, a lot of sense okay um i think uh we have gone way beyond uh, our first time today because it was a lovely chat um Again, uh, for anyone who's interested, please do join our uh, WeChat group. There are some legal tech discussions uh, ongoing there. Um, I would thank you, uh, Jane, again, for uh, the support and hosting this session. Uh, let, looking forward to future ones in which maybe we can do more vertical and specific topics. Of course, we'll ask our participants to give their feedback and uh, tell us, you know, what they want to explore more. We, we are definitely open to that. Uh, Jane, I leave it to you for the wrap up for saying bye to everyone. Maybe you can teach us how to say bye in Chinese so that we can also join you. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Then, uh, if anyone has, 如果, 如果, uh, 大家还有什么其他的问题, 也可以跟, uh, 嘉宾留的email和, 和我们这个, 那个啊，那谢谢大家，嗯，利用宝贵的时间来参与我们这个啊，呃，webinar. Okay, then let's speak, uh, say together. 再见. Can you say? Say that again. Sorry. 再见. 再见.
Yes, very good. Okay. Ciao, ciao, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.